welcome to North Point. We are so glad you're here today. We hope that you find our services very uplifting. That is our goal, to help people get to heaven. Amen. And i got to tell you, I'm just so overwhelmed, really, to even have a part in this ministry. I got to thinking about it. We announced we're having a clothing drive at our PRP campus, and the response was so overwhelming that we had to cap it last week. We had to tell the members, that's enough. We appreciate it. On most Tuesdays and Wednesdays, if you come by the building, you're going to see about 100 kids running around in our homeschool academy. Every time they're here, they're learning about God and His Word. And we stay so busy. Have you noticed how busy October has been? We stay busy. Our calendar is always full. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to be a part of an active, energetic, zealous congregation. And with that said, there are two events coming up. Quickly, I want to remind you about this coming Saturday, we have our Ladies' Day. October the 19th from 9 to 12, we've invited a guest speaker. We really hope that our sisters will buy into this, support this, invite others. That's this coming Saturday. And then our big event, the AP Apologetics Press Seminar. Creation versus Evolution with Kyle Butt. That's November the 1st through the 3rd, a Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning with questions and answers. I'm really excited about that. So uh, get ready. We've had a lot going on. We have a lot more going on. I think that's a sign of a living church. And I praise God for that. Will you pray with me? Father, we want to take just a moment to praise you, to give you all the honor and the glory. You deserve it. You've blessed this church so abundantly. We're thankful, Father, for the things going on here. We ask your continued blessings to be upon them. And now, Father, we pray that our service will be a sweet-smelling sacrifice, pleasing to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we continue our sermon series entitled, The Classics. You know what a classic is, right? A classic is something that has withstood the test of time and is still highly regarded for its quality or excellence. If you had a group of people talking about Christmas movies, somebody might say, Miracle on 34th Street is a classic. And you know what they mean by that. Or if you had a group of people standing around talking about crime movies, somebody might say, Now, The Godfather, that was a classic. You know what that means. Well, in this series, we are looking at classics from the Old Testament. All the stories of the Bible come from God. They have important lessons and therefore could all classify as classics. But we're looking at stories that kind of rise to the top. Stories that are more popular. Last week, we looked at David and Goliath. Today we're going to look at Elijah and the false prophets of Baal. That story is found in 1 Kings chapter 18. But before we look at it, let's ask the question why. Why are we doing a sermon series on Old Testament stories? After all, we live in the New Testament. Well, we're looking at these stories because they have been preserved for our learning. They're not just for our entertainment, they're for our education. Romans 15 verse 4 says of the Old Testament, Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 says, These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of this age. And so God didn't... didn't preserve these stories just to be historical or to be entertaining. They're designed to be informative. They have been preserved for our learning. And so that's why we're doing this. As I said, we're going to look at 1 Kings 18, the story of Elijah and the false prophets of Baal. Let me set the scene. We are introduced to Elijah in 1 Kings 17. He kind of comes out of nowhere. You've heard of the movie Jaws, right? Everybody has. Did you know that Jaws is celebrating its 50th 
birthday next year? That movie was released in 1975. It was the highest grossing film of its time. It's about a great white shark that causes havoc on a community. Well, the script of Jaws wastes no time getting to the action. The movie begins with people sitting around a fire on the beach late at night. When a girl gets up and decides she wants to go for a swim, she jumps in the ocean, and you can fill in the blank. She's eaten by a shark and dies. Three minutes into the movie, we have a shark attack. Well, just as Jaws starts off abruptly, the story of Elijah starts off abruptly. We don't have any forewarning that he's coming. There's no lead up to his arrival. Just out of the blue, boom, here's Elijah. And in the very verse where he's announced, he's standing before the wicked king Ahab prophesying against him. Bam, there he is. And he tells Ahab, the wicked king, that there will be neither dew nor rain these next few years except by my word. Now that's quite a confrontation, isn't it? Out of all the kings of Israel, Ahab was the worst. The Bible says so. In chapter 16, verse 30, we read, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And verse 33 adds, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's quite an accomplishment. If you know anything about those northern tribes, the, the kingdom of Israel, they had a lot of wicked kings. And yet the Bible says Ahab was the worst of all. And so here comes Elijah, just appearing out of the blue, abruptly. He's standing before the king, and he's making a bold prediction against him. He says, you better get ready, a drought is coming. Well, immediately after making that pronouncement, God says, get out of here. I want you to flee to the east, hide out by a brook. You can drink its water, and I will send ravens to feed you. And so Elijah goes. He's there for a while, but before long, the brook starts to dry up. There was a drought, you know. God then says, all right, I want you to go to Zarephath, and you'll find a widow there. She's going to provide for you. As soon as he gets to the city gate, he sees a widow gathering sticks. He said to her, can you do me a favor? I would really like a cup of water and some bread, please. The widow replied, sir, I'd love to help you. But all I've got left is a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug. I'm gathering these sticks to go home and make me and my son a final meal. After that, we'll probably starve to death. Elijah said, now I can appreciate that. But I'm a prophet of God. And I'm telling you, God says if you make me something to eat first, your cupboard will never run bare. You'll always have enough flour and oil during the famine. She stepped out in faith. And she was rewarded. Sure enough, all during that famine, her and her son always had enough flour, and they always had enough oil. Well, a little bit later, the widow's son becomes sick, deathly ill, and he passes away. She was confused and hurt. She asked the prophet, is this why you've come to my house? Have you come to expose some sin? Elijah grabbed up the boy, carried him upstairs to the bedroom. He laid him on the bed, and he fervently prayed to God, Please, restore his life, please. He stretched himself over the boy's body three times, and the Bible says his spirit returned. The boy was raised from the dead. Amen. Now, let me give you an interesting tidbit. Do you know how many resurrections there were in the Old Testament? Three. This is the first. 
The raising of the widow's son is the first resurrection in the Bible. It is one of three in the Old Testament. Those three involving Elijah and Elisha involve two young people and one older person. Fast forward to the Gospels. Do you know how many people Jesus raised from the dead? Three, two young people, and one older person. Now, I don't know if that was intentional or not. I believe it is. But clearly there seems to be a parallel between what they're doing in the Old Testament and what Jesus does in the Gospels. And so he raises this boy to life. He carries him downstairs and the mother rejoices, praising God. As we move into chapter 18, three years have passed. And God says it's time to go back. During that third year, he said, I want you to go see Ahab. Rain is in the forecast. As Elijah is going to see Ahab, he encounters a man named Obadiah. This is not Obadiah the prophet. This is another Obadiah. This was the king's chamberlain. He took care of Ahab's house. But he was a believer in God. Working for a wicked king, but he was a believer in God. He encounters Elijah. Now you need to understand, Elijah was wanted. He was public enemy number one. In fact, did you know that Ahab had sent men to all the surrounding countries looking for Elijah? And if they said Elijah wasn't there, he made them swear with an oath. And so this is a big deal. God tells Elijah, go to Ahab. He encounters Obadiah along the way, who works for Ahab. And he says, go tell your boss, I'm back. Go tell Ahab that I want to see him. But Obadiah was frantic. What are you trying to do? You trying to get me killed? If I go and tell Ahab that you're here, and the Spirit leads you away somewhere... He's going to kill me. After all, Elijah was known for appearing and disappearing. Being here one minute, gone the next. But Elijah said to Obadiah, don't worry about it. I promise I'm not going anywhere. Well, Obadiah goes to Ahab. He says, look, Elijah's back and he wants to see you. This is what happened next. 1 Kings 18, beginning at verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I've not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the bells. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. If this were a movie, the suspenseful music would be playing. Here comes Elijah meeting with Ahab. For three years now, Ahab has wanted this man dead. He blames Elijah for all of Israel's problems. And when he sees him, he says, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Can you not relate to that as a Christian today? Ahab said to Elijah, You're the troubler of Israel. I think a lot of people in America look at Christians as the troubler of America. You're the people who don't fall in line with the LGBTQ agenda You're the people who speak out against women aborting their babies. You're the people causing the problem. But we're not causing the problem. They're causing the problem. They're the ones rebelling against the word of God. And so we can relate with Elijah. I I picture Elijah saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not the troublemaker. You are. And he tells him why. Because you and your family have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the bells. You have compromised spiritually. 
Elijah says, I want you to go and call all of Israel together, along with all the false prophets. We're going to have a meeting at Mount Carmel. And amazingly, Ahab agrees. Notice verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Now I want you to picture this scene, right? Here you're on Mount Carmel. All the assembly of Israel is gathered together. I don't know, are we talking thousands? Tens of thousands? I don't know, but there's a multitude there. Also in the assembly are the hundreds of prophets of Baal, along with King Ahab. I would imagine there was a lot of tension in the air. A lot of nervous anticipation. And then the crowd fell completely silent. Can you envision this as Elijah walks forward to address the crowd? Can I have your attention please? I don't know if he said that or not, maybe. Can I have your attention please? Now, notice who's talking. His picture is in every post office with a wanted sign above it. The government has been blaming him for this famine all the while and now he's standing in your midst and he has something to say. He said to the people, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? Literally, do you know what that reads in Hebrew? How long are you going to keep hopping back and forth on your legs? That's the idea. So you're leaning on your left leg, then you hop to your right leg for a little while, then you hop back to your left leg, just back and forth, back and forth. He's talking about their religious compromise. They wanted to ride the fence. They wanted to have it both ways. And Elijah said, you can't. These are mutually exclusive loyalties. You can't serve God on one hand and Baal on the other. By the way, in your Bible, and it's true in this text as well, Lord is probably in all caps. Do you know why? Anytime you read the word Lord in all caps, it is referring to the tetragrammaton, or the four letters That's what that word means in Greek. Y-H-W-H. The personal name of God, Yahweh. Now, we have supplied the vowels, but the consonants are Y-H-W-H. And what Elijah is saying in essence is, either serve Yahweh or serve Bel, but you can't serve both. And the people had no response. They didn't know what to say. The truth is, they were religious compromisers. They were trying to have it both ways. Elijah said, you can't do that. Verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken." Elijah said, I'm issuing a challenge. I'm proposing a contest. And I'm going to stack the odds in your favor. Have you ever thought about that? Elijah is giving them all of the advantages. If you're looking at this on paper and you're a betting man, you're going to bet against Elijah. Think about it. 
Number one, he's greatly outnumbered. They are in the majority, 450 to one. Those don't sound like good odds, do they? On top of that, he's going to let them pick which bull they want. You can have first pick. Take whatever bull you want, I'll take whatever's left. Number three, he proposes a contest by fire. Well, that's Bell's forte. Bell was the storm god. They believe that he controlled rain. Yeah, right, three years of no rain. But they believed he controlled rain, thunder, and lightning. And so if you're a worshiper of Bell and he's proposing a contest by fire, well, hey, that's, that's right up Bell's alley. They're doing this on Mount Carmel. That's Bell's territory. Mount Carmel, and especially the territory just north of Mount Carmel, was wholly given to paganism, idolatry. And one of the gods they worshipped was Bell. And so the odds are stacked against Elijah, aren't they? How could they possibly turn him down? He's giving them every possible benefit. But I believe it was Martin Luther who once said, With God, one is the majority. Elijah knew, really, the odds are stacked in my favor. You know, as you think about it, yeah, Baal is the god of storms. This seems to be to his advantage but you know, Yahweh, he appeared in a burning bush. He led the children of Israel by fire at night. He called down fire on Nadab and Abihu when they broke his law. So while it is true that it looks like Baal will have the advantage, the true God, Yahweh, this is his territory too. Elijah knew that. Well, now we get down to the nitty-gritty. Verse 26. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Bel from morning until noon, saying, O Bel, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Elijah said, you guys go first. All right, we'll take that bull right there, please. They got their altar ready, they cut the bull into pieces, laid it on the altar and began crying out, O oh, Bell, answer us. Did you notice how long they were calling out, praying to their God? The Bible says from morning until noon. Hmm. Are we talking at least three or four hours probably? Can you imagine that? Here you are on Mount Carmel witnessing this. And for three to four hours, they are frantically calling out to Bell, Oh, Bell, answer us! Answer us! But there was no voice and no one answered. Why? Because there's no one to answer. Bell is not a true God. He's made up. But they cried and limped around their altar. At noon, Elijah said, okay, I've kept quiet long enough. The Bible says he began mocking them. He began mocking the, the false prophets. And it's interesting to note, one of the things he said is, maybe your God is relieving himself. Maybe your God's on the toilet, is what he's saying. <laughs> Now, someone might look at that and say, well, I, I don't know if we ought to be doing that. Even if we're dealing with false teachers, I don't know. Listen, with most people, you deal gently. But when you're dealing with false teachers, leading the people astray, 
That requires tough love. And that's what Elijah is doing. He's mocking them. He's trying to expose them to all the people. Why? Because he loves the people. Come on, either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or maybe he's asleep. Can you imagine how that infuriated the false prophets? They're already disheartened. Their God is not answering with fire. And now the other guy starts making fun of you? The Bible says they cried aloud and cut themselves with swords and lances. Can anybody doubt their sincerity? Now, they were sincerely wrong, but would anybody doubt or deny their their sincerity? Going so far as to cut yourself after you've already prayed for hours? Well, this went on until 3 p.m. 3 p.m. And finally, Elijah said, enough. It's it's my turn. You've had your chance. Your God didn't answer. It's my turn. And so Elijah went over. He rebuilt the altar of Yahweh that had been thrown down. I think there's a lesson in that. Our spiritual journeys consist of highs and lows, don't they? That's true of all of us. We have highs and lows spiritually. And there are times in our lives when, truthfully, we abandon our altar, don't we? Or we allow some allurement of this world to tear it down. Well, if that's true now, maybe it's time to rebuild that altar. To put that altar back together. That's what Elijah did. He first rebuilt the altar. Then he took a bull, cut it into pieces, and laid the bull on the altar. Then he called for water, a lot of water. He said, bring a bunch of water. I want this thing doused in it, drench it. He had him do that three times. There was so much water covering the altar that the Bible says the trench around it was overflowing with water. Now, why would Elijah do that? Everybody's going to know this is God. Nobody's going to be able to say that this was some chance, some random occurrence. No, if this thing lights up with fire, nobody can deny it's God. And this is what happens next, verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know you well, O Lord, our God, and that you've turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and, I love this part, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Amen. The people have turned from the 450 false prophets. And they're all laser focused on Elijah. They probably shook their heads in amazement as he doused his sacrifice with water. And then they listened carefully as he prayed to God. Did you notice his prayer? It's pretty short. We read it in just a few seconds. I think it consists of about 60 words. Compare his short prayer, consisting of roughly 60 words, to their six hours of praying. It's not about quantity, is it? It's about quality. It's about worshiping the right God, the right way, in sincerity and truth. His prayer is brief. 
But as James says in James 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man has much power. And if you remember, James uses Elijah as his example. And so he prays to God, and the Bible says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, along with the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even the water in the trench was licked up. Now put yourself in their shoes. Try to envision this. You're one of the people watching the whole event. And then suddenly, I'm assuming it was lightning, maybe just a fire bolt, Suddenly, after six hours of nothing, the whole altar is consumed. Can you imagine what was running through their minds? Can you imagine seeing that, smelling that in real time? Poof! And the people did what any of us would do. They fell on their faces and began screaming, Yahweh is God! Yahweh is God! Yahweh is God! Elijah bowed? No, he didn't. I'm kidding. He could have. But he then tells the people, round up the false prophets and slaughter them. Now, why would he do that? That was actually in keeping with the old law. Here we have the contest at Mount Carmel. Elijah versus the 450 false prophets. What can we learn from this story? I shared seven lessons last week. Quickly, I'll do it again. Number one, we learned that we must make a choice. Right? You can't ride the fence. You can't have one part of your heart with God and one part of your, your heart somewhere else. I'm reminded of a story involving Michael Jordan. He had signed with Nike. He was incredibly loyal to Nike. Well, one day he was visiting a friend. He walked into his friend's closet and saw that on one side of the closet, he had Nike gear. On the other side of the closet, he had Puma gear. Without saying a word, Michael Jordan walked into his friend's kitchen, pulled out a butcher knife walked into the closet, pulled all of the Puma gear off, and cut it into pieces. He then picked up the pieces, took them to the dumpster, and when he returned, he said, you cannot ride the fence. Now, he did that with an apparel company. Elijah is doing that with God. It's either all or nothing. You're either all in or you're all out. You cannot ride the fence. Jesus once said, you cannot serve God and money. you got to make a choice. Number two, truth must be contended for. Jude 3 says that we're to earnestly contend for the faith. That word contend means to fight or strive. None of us likes controversy, right? I don't. But sometimes controversy is unavoidable. There are times when we have to take a stand. Paul said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but make no mistake about it, we do wrestle. We are to stand up and speak out for truth. That's what Elijah was doing. Number three, truth is not determined by sincerity. Those false prophets were utterly sincere. I don't doubt that. Would you spend six, seven hours, however long it was, praying and stomping around and cutting yourself? If their heart wasn't in it, they wouldn't have done it. They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. A lot of people today have the, the misidea that as long as you're sincere, God's going to accept anything. No, you have to be sincere. But sincerity alone will not save. Number four, truth is not determined by numbers. 450 to one. And by the way, as you think about the multitude gathered there, a lot of those people were probably rooting against Elijah. Right? They had been fed all this fake news, all this misinformation. The government was saying he's to blame. He's the one who did this. 
So not only did you have the 450 false prophets, but you had a lot of people in the crowd who didn't like you. And oh, there's King Ahab too. Elijah was certainly outnumbered. But when God's on your side, that doesn't matter. Number five, false teachers are not to be tolerated. We don't like to think about false teachers, right? Like that sounds just so like old-fashioned, almost outdated. Preacher talking about false teachers. Wolves in sheep's clothing. We're like, really? Yeah, really, there are false teachers. We hate to think that. But there are false teachers. And for various reasons, they may deliberately try to lead people away. When they do that, they're not to be ignored. They're to be confronted. Number six, God is the ultimate advantage. God is the ultimate advantage. It looked like everything was going against Elijah. Oh, but wait, he had Yahweh on his side. You can have home court advantage. You can have the majority. You can have first pick of which bull to use. You can have it all. If I've got God, I've got all I need. He's the ultimate advantage. And number seven, truth has nothing to fear. That's important. You ever thought about getting involved in a conversation with maybe a family member or a friend or a co-worker? And then you decide against it. Like you almost did it. You wanted to do it. You knew you ought to do it. But at the last minute, oh, I'll I'll just wait. Why did you do that? Because you're scared. I'm not knocking you. Like I get scared too. Like in those moments when we bail, it's often because we're scared, right? We're afraid. Afraid of, will they reject me? Or what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Paul got scared. When he went to Corinth in Acts 18, the Lord had to appear to him at night and say, Paul, it's okay, don't be afraid. It's all right to be afraid. The Bible condemns cowardice. Cowardice is when you let that fear keep you from doing what God called you to do. If your brow is sweating and your heart is beating and you've got all these uncomfortable feelings in your body as you go up and share the gospel, that's okay. Do it anyway. Knowing that truth has nothing to fear. Elijah knew that. My prayer is we'll know that too. Again, these stories are not just for our entertainment. They're for our education. They've been preserved for our learning. And I hope these lessons help. If you're here today and not a child of God, we never conclude without giving you an opportunity to become one. By believing on the Lord Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Jesus, and being immersed in water to have all your past sins washed away. Jesus came to live here so we could live with him. He doesn't ask much. Jesus doesn't say, hey, go die on a cross. He did that. All he says is, pick up your cross and follow me. If you've never obeyed the gospel, now's the time to do it. Or if you have obeyed but you've sinned publicly and need our prayers, this invitation's for you too. Please come as we stand and sing.